You want to get so very tiny. Firefox has been playing with fire. WebOS is back, baby. And someone's building an Iron Man mask. Trust me, that'll make sense when we get to it. Not really, but it will. But uh, yeah, it's another great day for Linux, everyone. So let's go. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we can sit back, relax, and talk about some of the wicked neat things going on in Penguin Land. I'm Vince Stone here at LGC Actual. Switching all this nightmare. Um, not not really fuel. It's more of a, a gelatinous uh, ball of happiness. Joined every week by this man over here on the island from Hello. Space Britannia. That's one Pedro Mateus, man. What's going on, buddy? Uh, uh, I got a new work laptop. Um mm-hmm. uh, it's uh i was very sudden yesterday when uh, i got it, it's like yeah you need to give back your thinkpad it's like why because uh because you're getting a uh a new laptop uh, but i like the thinkpad because you're relentlessly oh, making you're... fun of gingers no. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair that's nathan uh but <laughs> it's uh the, the, they said no, no no you're getting a you're getting an xps 13. oh yeah no uh oh, that that thinkpad stinks Give me, give me. I want me some of that. <laughs> <laughs> Good times. Um, not much to report over here, uh, other than uh, I just wish the temperature would stabilize because I have a lot of metal in my body that expands and contracts, and it'd be nice if it would pick a shape and stay there. Also, have, I remember to bring the arch arch tears. That's uh, n- nice and warm because it's like wicked chilly. Mm-hmm. Mm. That's going to do it for that. So let's get right into what's been going on. This is uh, from OMG Ubuntu, man. Uh, they've made the small smaller. The minimal image is even yes. more minimal, down to 28. 28 megabytes, Pedro. I don't know if I can trust just 28 megs. It doesn't seem like that's possible unless you know anything about Linux. And uh, <laughs> the Bionic it's... minimal image, man, uh, it's 10% down. Just 28 megs from 37 for the 1604 LTS. Uh, Mm -hmm. Originally, 65 megs for the 1404 base image. So now, correct me if I'm right, this is just effectively busy box and steroids. This is not meant for... um, Yeah. (laughs) It's, uh, It's just a very... The base package is so you can pseudo pixie boot your uh laptop your desktop whatever you're building and you get to pick exactly what you want to install and it's uh even though it's you want to it's not going to be as easy and as uh intuitive if you're a new person coming to linux it's not going to be the ubuntu experience you are probably expecting but it is great if you want to build a image from scratch that you are going to deploy to every single laptop at your company, every single desktop, maybe even servers. Mm -hmm. Uh, That is a very good base to start with because it only comes with the bare minimum for that network boot. And then you're off to the races. It's, uh, it's actually kind of amazing how they got it down to 28 megabytes. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, uh, containers, yeah, containers. That, I was about to say before the uh, resident uh, Frenchman <laughs> implodes, explodes, or whatever's. Yeah, okay, I get that. I think maybe we should have, if we ever get around to doing a live event, we, we can set up a couple of identical boxes and say, all right, first one to get Deus Ex up and running from the minimal image. Go. Mm-hmm. Time it. That'd be fun to watch. <laughs> Although that would take a long time to uh, download. No, no, <laughs> local re- repositories, man. Oh, okay, all right, all right. Yeah, you can do those with Steam now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. over RS two thirty two. It's still going to, I don't know, thirty five gigs. Yeah, it's still going to be a while. <laughs> It'd be a bit, man, because like Deus Ex is like seventy five gigs uncompressed. Okay, uh, you like this KDE yeah. Connect thing? I am someone who is just. Google, I have already sold my soul to Google, but for those of you who have not, 
Uh, there's a it's uh, news, yeah. it also works with Google. It's a uh, it's a bit of an Android companion app to Kitty itself. Although you can now run the uh, PC version on other uh, desktop environments uh, with the uh, Kitty Connect indicator. Now Kitty Connect, uh, we've talked about it before. I've been using it in phones, tablet, uh, even the Chromebook, and it does a lot of great stuff. It lets you have the um, you can have you can do the Google voice typing from the phone to the PC. You can control the media from the phone that you're playing on your PC. If you say you're watching a video on VLC and you get a call, the video pauses and your phone starts ringing and there's just a teeny tiny delay that it scares you to thinking, oh boy, what's going on? Um, and uh, the... Oh man, I, well, I, was, the team I behind... was about to go off because I just saw this top part here for your audio listeners and that looked like it's <laughs> almost at Lincoln Park and I was just about to invalidate this entire <laughs> blog. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, that's one of the things they introduced with the new version. They say that they've been quiet with the uh, little updates uh, on the development of KDE Connect and the media player now shows the uh, cover art of whatever media you're playing. Uh, it lets you... Say, if you have a text input field on your phone uh, and you don't want to deal with the uh, the touch keyboard, you can now type from your PC on your fancy mechanical keyboard in the little text field that it gives you on the notification thing. So that is a very good thing, as if I wasn't enough of a fan of Kitty Connect already. Now, practical uses, need... man. Hit me with the practical use. Yes. <laughs> It's uh, one of the things that I really want them to bring is the ability to have like synergy almost that you can have. You can use the mouse and keyboard from your PC on your phone. You just have your phone on a little stand on your desk and you can just scooch your mouse over to your phone and you can interact with it using the PC peripherals. Also being able to maybe make a phone call and use this microphone right here, the AT2020, and this headset to listen and talk to people. That would be very nice indeed. Yeah. All right. Um, my my yeah. take, I, I am not hating on this at all. So I am just telling you my view from it. With the Synergy stuff, that sounds neat until I realize that there's a capacitive digitizer built onto the front of the device. So it really <laughs> seems like uh, you're using the touch green with a bunch of extra steps in between uh with that also with like making a call it's like isn't that kind of like uh reaching over and picking the phone up with a bunch of extra steps it's uh until we get the the goal the end goal here which is you come home you plug your phone into a little dock mm -hmm. and it becomes your pc so until we get to that if you could just have your phone while it's charging just turn on the uh, the Wi-Fi's and control it with your mouse and keyboard, and chances are you're going to get a call while you're home because people know, oh, this person is working, so I'm going to wait till our off work to call them because they're annoying like that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's neat technology. I'm sure I will be able to find ways to mess with people with it because it seems ripe for that. Mm -hmm. Up <laughs> next is, it's not a slice of pie. I guess it would be a pie of slice. I don't know how to phrase this, man. It's a slice of something. So uh, now you can run Raspberry Pi's Pixel Desktop on PC or Mac. An Exxon modified build, uh, 180316 with Refractor tools. So that sounds very um, techno babbly, but when you get down to it, it, all it's telling you is that you can run Debian or you know, the PC version of Raspbian, uh, with the Pixel desktop environment, which is just LXDE with a couple of modifications. So uh, maybe I'm missing something, but where's the uh, where's the news here? <laughs> well, this is the new build, man. It's the refractor tools. I don't know. It. I, I honestly don't understand why this exists. I mean, okay. It's maybe if you wanted like a wicked light non Chromebook type Chromebook thing. I I don't know. <laughs> I genuinely don't know. It's Debian with LXDE. Hey, guess what? You can already do that. 
you have been able to do that for decades now. True, but this, so... is, this is giving you the same experience that you would get on your Raspberry Pi, though, correct? Uh, why would you want to have the same experience on your PC? I, I didn't ask you, you how you felt about it. I asked you, is that what it does? <laughs> I guess, but I failed to see the point. Maybe you really like your desktop on your Pi and you want to bring that to your PC. I'm not in charge of their sales department, by the way, but, um, I don't know. I still don't see it. <laughs> it's thing. Maybe you want to play with it, man. Uh, so we should all quit using Firefox, right? And just throw it out, set it on fire and run away in terror. Is that what you're trying to tell me? I mean, it doesn't really make a difference now, does it? I mean, it's been there for nine years. Nine years! Where the master password has been encrypted, quote-unquote, using SHA-1. Yes, a very low iteration SHA-1. So, if you've been around on the interwebs for the past know, two, three years, you've heard of countless stories of forums that were hacked because they were hashing their passwords with SHA-1. Don't use SHA-1 anymore. And Firefox has been using it to encrypt the frickin' master password for the past nine years! Yeah, Firefox. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> Are you mad, bro? A little bit, yeah. You know that sinking feeling when you realize that, like, the backup process on that server that you're helping your friend run uh, has crashed, like, three months ago, and it's basically been running live, and that's it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> The last backup was from three months ago. You know that sinking feeling that you get in your stomach? That's how I felt when I read this news. It's like, oh, shh. Well, I mean, the article says a low iteration count makes it incredibly easy for an attacker to brute force the master password and later decrypt the encrypted password stored inside Firefox or Thunderbird databases. Um, yeah. I mean, it's been yeah. around for like nine years, though. And... Mm-hmm. And someone reported it nine years ago uh, and said, uh, yeah, no, this is a problem. This is easily bypassable. Mm -hmm. uh, and Strider, I specifically said two, three years ago. Ah, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it wasn't until they brought up the, the, uh, the original uh, bug report that Mozilla went, oh, yeah, no, we're fixing that. Well, we should. Later. Yeah, man, they are. You can currently sort this issue by downloading, uh, what is the name of the plugin that they're offering that's going to be part of the new Firefox? Oh, the, uh, uh... It's at the bottom of the article. Uh, art, no. Lockbox. Lockbox. It looks like a sea monster. Yeah. It's a plugin for Firefox <laughs> that is going to have the functionality of what's going to be built into Firefox in the future. So... I don't see a reason not to use that, but, you know, whatever. I mean, again, it's been around for nine years, and yes, it's a valid it's point. It's locally like stored. years ago. Right. Yeah, this is the master password. It's stored locally, so someone would need to have access to your box. Not exactly, you know, physical access, mm -hmm. but if someone SSHs into your um, session or you d didn't encrypt your home directory... That password is stored locally, and it could be used. Or you can just go through. It's the master like, password. I look at half the times when you're using Chrome, and I'm like, oh, man, I forgot the password. The password's wrong. Chrome just stays logged in, period. You just go there, and it's like you click on Chrome. It's like, show me the passwords. Mm -hmm. Chrome's like, okay, I don't care. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a thing. So something happened this week that we get to talk about. And it, that something is a thing that I'm going to constantly keep referring to as WeebOS because. <laughs> With only the one E, yes. Well, it's WebOS. You've been on the interwebs. You've heard of it, right? I've heard about it. And well, not only have I heard about it, I went out. This has been several years back. They've had a fire cell. I think it was HP had a tablet with WebOS on it. And they marked it down at all the best buys and fries for 99 wet sneaky cash. It's like a 10-inch tablet. I have one somewhere in this house. I cannot find it. I 
didn't tear the place apart looking for it, but I tore chunks of the house in part trying to find it for a demo thing. But you might know this because it's on your TV, because that's where it has ended up in a lot of different places. But um, yep. hey, look at it this way. Maybe WebOS is going to rain once more, and that's a half joke because it never really took off. And mm-hmm. open sourcing it is in the industry known as in this particular in this particular case, not <laughs> universal by a long stretch, but it's also known as the last ditch effort at adoption because it no yeah. one ever really picked it up. Um it's licensed mostly under Apache 2.0, so it's got that going for it. Now, I think probably one of the big things, like the good benefits to come from this, is people with older TVs and IoT des- uh, desktop set-top boxes, they might be able to get updates so things like Netflix run again or the YouTube plugin can get Home updated. Homebrew. Right. Yeah. And it's... Uh... There's a reason that WebOS didn't really take off in the uh, non-embedded market the first time around. Maybe making it open source will give it that bit uh, extra... I don't know. What do we, what do we want to call it? Reach? Uh, and people will actually start using it for different things now. It could be a thing. It is... Well, it's been around for a while mm. it's got legacy going for it i guess jill said it's the second time it's been open sourced uh web zone they have that it. it's in the notes i get sdk for it and i don't know maybe this this is the time and <laughs> next year we'll all be maybe running. this time it's all of it I, I honestly don't remember the first time it went open source i don't know i remember <laughs> the the tablet was all right but the only reason i bought the tablet was because i knew i could get Android running on it, which was a horrible, horrible experience. And then I had a BlackBerry tablet too, but I forget what that thing ran. It was there, basically what you see in a bunch of automotive operating systems. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm sure someone will point that out in a hot second. So what do we have up next? Up next, thinking of, uh, speaking of things that uh, have gone open source, um, well, we have private internet access. It's the VPN, what I use. I'm not using it right now, but uh, every now and again, I uh, turn it on to say, go browse the local video store, so to speak. q and that's trick- what I was trying to remember. <laughs> Sorry, that was going to bug me. The rest of the show, I had to get that out. Go ahead. Yes. Thanks, Popey. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's uh, private internet access. They say that they are going to uh, open source over the past couple of months, uh, over the next couple of months, not past, uh, they are going to open source all the client-side applications that you can uh, use to access their VPN. Uh, they have Android apps, they have uh, Linux uh, native apps, they have a bunch of different stuff that you can use. And and the uh, to I guess to go along with this, they have a bit of a sale going on. If you subscribe for two years... Uh, they're bringing down the cost to uh, $2.20 a month. That's like less than $53 for unlimited traffic, up to five devices, and VPN service. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'm not chilling for them. I use their product. They're, they haven't paid me anything. I paid for their uh, service. It works really well. Uh, so yeah, private internet access. Good on you. Uh, listen, I don't. I don't have control of whether or not you summon cash penguin, which you clearly did. Um, no, we're not affiliated with. No, I don't even remember what the name of it was. Uh, do keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, uh, if you're not paying for the VPN you're using, you're the product. Please keep that in mind. Good on them mm-hmm. for doing that. They understand they can make a not necessarily a business model, but a better business model by. Saying, hey, man, you, you want to poke at the code and make sure we're not doing anything turbo sketchy in here? Here, have that. And yeah. that, you know, become a services company, which they already are as a VPN. I don't really use VPNs, so I don't have anything against them. I'm just too lazy to set one up. And also don't have a need for one. Um, Good. Good on them. We yeah. want to see more of that. And so that's just a plug-in you can put in Firefox and Chrome, right? Pretty easy. 
Yeah, yeah. You can uh, you can just download the uh, desktop client, and anything you use that uh, connects to the interwebs is going to get routed through the VPN. Uh, same thing on Android, and it works in non-rooted devices as well, which is very helpful if for some reason you can't root that particular Android device, what you have. Kids, don't, don't run root, rooted devices. If you need to install SuperSU to install that one thing you need to install, be it titanium backup, be it um, <laughs> Attaway, then remove SuperSU. Just mm-hmm. play it safe, man. Play it safe. So, uh, yep. hey, man. I might be a long-haired hippie, uh, so I kind of like this a little bit. This is to improve urban food distribution by connecting community gardens with pickers. Yeah, we're talking about Garden Hub. They got a Git page, and this is a neat little project I just wanted to let everyone know about. Formed around the simple idea that food should not go to waste. I think we can all get behind that. Garden Hub is a solution to the problem of community garden and food. Basically, if you're growing some stuff, it's getting ripe. You want to get rid of it and maybe make a little jingle jangle some chuckles on the side this is going to help tie together you know and you can do it with you know from restaurants local charities anything there's a bunch of different ways to get everyone tied together and yeah this is going to let everyone get together and collaborate you know it's docker thing so you don't need to, yep. to do a whole lot to set this thing up however Installing Docker on 1710. Well, that sounds like a nightmare. I'm not kidding, but pretty easy to set up. And I'm saying that is we're just kind of looking through it. I like the idea. I wanted to give them a plug, but got to be perfectly honest with you, Pedro. The um, you know, the technology is good. Good idea. Get the gardeners mm-hmm. collaborate. Yes. What's growing, ripening, harvesting, and the people who need it and the people who want it. But the me diagram. Mm -hmm. see i own it i own it um (laughs) the me diagram of people who garden versus the people who know what a github is i I just don't see that intersection being no that's exactly what i wrote in the notes when i i was going through this like oh it's neat it uses docker so it can run anywhere uh, are the turbo organic farmers going to be able to know what the hell a Docker is and how to use it? Let alone GitHub. Mm. <laughs> hey, if this this is where we step in, not, maybe not necessarily us as individuals, but you listening to the show. Yeah, you the know, techie people. Yeah, you know this tool is available, and it has the ability not only to help people but also make them money. So they could be interested in it and your services and setting it up. Quick mention to this next story is real-time ray tracing because ever since I made my first triangle and glide, I'm not going to tell you how long ago that was, but it was a long time ago. Um, They've been promising real-time, like it's going to happen in 10 years from now. And yeah, it never has, has it? Real-time ray tracing. Nope. It's it is a thing. Uh, it it gets some use, especially in enterprise markets, and that seems to be what this is uh, being geared towards. And AMD have been going, oh yeah, no, uh, we have uh, ray tracing technology. We can do it, and we can do it over Vulcan. Yes, uh, the Kronos Group and AMD have uh, basically. They got together and said, yeah, let's make ray tracing something that's usable, something that's not as system intensive, something that is scalable. Going for CAD, which that's a good place to start. They got a thing called VEZ. VEZ. All right. I'm seeing how they I'm supposed to enunciate it. And that's a little bit of a their middleware, you know, their API on top of Vulcan for this business. Mm -hmm. And this eventually will probably end up getting filtered down to gaming 10 years from now. Just ask me in 10 years if it's still 10 years away i was a little worried or I shouldn't say worried but i was like wait a minute wait a tick because i saw that i can't hear you what <laughs> thank you <laughs> i've pedro has sensitive ears uh no i was a little <laughs> i saw the thing that nvidia released and like using direct x whatever we're bringing real time um you know photorealistic real time ray tracing And then AMD dropped this yesterday and just good to see it being done with Vulcan simply because now it works everywhere. 
Yep. <laughs> and, and it's um, we've seen ray tracing make its way onto other things. Speaking from experience myself, video games. You like open source engine re-implementations of uh, video games. There's always that one project. Is uh, Oh, no, we're going to use ray tracing to do this. We're going to use path tracing to do that. And they are they look very good. Make no mistake. They look amazing. But the resource, the, the amount of resources that they consume while they're doing this is insane. So introducing Vulkan, a lower level API that can better use all of the resources available to it instead of uh, putting all of that uh, path tracing and ray tracing on the um, on the one thread of the processor and just having the GPU do what it can with that one thread. Now it can scale across all the threads that you got and it evens things out and it'll be able to more effectively use the GPU. Which is great. That's what GPUs are there for, to make graphics all shiny and stuff. Oh, man. Uh, Weekly Daily Wednesday is bringing you the technical madness, like all shiny and stuff. I love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, real quick, up next, uh, before we bounce out of here, we, we've we said less than kind things about the 390-40, well, the 390-25, really, so the NVIDIA binary driver. And one of mm-hmm. the biggest issues was outside of a, ugh, a gang of really busted stuff that it did. One thing was Chrome ran like junk. Firefox, brilliant. Mm-hmm. Vivaldi, less of a hit. But Chrome, I mean, it was a hot, jerky mess. And NVIDIA genuinely for the last month and a half said, we, 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 all right, I should say Aaron Platner said, I can't reproduce this while well, everyone was able to reproduce this. Well, everyone, somebody figured out what the issue was. If you launch Chrome with the uh, no sandbox option, don't do that. Um, With the 390.24, it fixes the rendering issues and the hard freezes and locks that were just very, very bad. I tested this and uh, yeah. I mean, it gets things done. So I guess if you're in some weird situation where you absolutely have to run... Now the... What is it? The 42, 390, 42 driver supposedly fixed this? I don't know. I haven't tried to get Mm -hmm. them up. Well, I've tried to get them up and working with Kumbuntu, but I entered the wrong launch codes and the PPA is... That's been out for two weeks and it's only been updated Mm -hmm. for 1804 beta. So that needs to get sorted. And installing yeah. the run files is just, uh, I, I tried doing that and it didn't, doesn't work all the time because it's Ubuntu. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. I can do that on any Fedora box any day for the past decade. Just yep. drop into TTY, run it. It's done, but nope. Mm-mm. <laughs> so that'll fix you. No, it's, it's, it, it's not a fix. It's a workaround and don't use it. Just don't go back to the 387 dot whatever uh nvidia drivers use those instead those are good those still work really well they don't support the uh, 415 kernel but you probably don't even have a reason to be using it in the first place unless you have an intel cpu at which point i say "Ah (laughs) (laughs) (sighs) sorry He's easily amused. And you can support that easily amused critter by heading over to LinuxGameCast.com. And tap the support button. We get our patrons. We get our affiliate links. We, we even have a little wish zone. Uh, humble. We've raised over a hundred something dollars for charity. For people shopping through that. We got PayPal oh, buttons. Awesome. <laughs> magic internet monies, man. You name it. We got it. Because that, that's kind of how we roll. I mean, if you, you can come up with a way. We can do that, but we want to give a quick shout out to the beautiful party patrons who do make this show possible. This is a Patreon goal, Pedro, and that we hit it, and we want to keep doing more. 117 beautiful people kicking us. $228 a week. That is four quarters. Four quarters a week, man. It's madness. Yeah. If you could spare four quarters a a week, you could help bring more distortion like this. And we're heading towards, we're at 228 of that 250 goal. To bring on mm-hmm. the threes company. That's a third person. We got room for a third person next to Pedro. Jill will be joining oh, us. Actually, Jill's going to be joining us 
Next week, we're going to hear all about the scale. You'll see what's going on with mm-hmm. that. But we bring you stuff Tuesdays and Thursdays and all that nonsense. We love it. Uh, we do want to thank uh, Herr Tim, who sent in a PayPal donation this week. Or, yeah, technically, Indeed. since last week. That was, like, surprising. I was like, oh, we still have PayPal buttons. I forgot all about those. Um, <laughs> thank you, because we immediately put that towards cables for these two, which are Theron. Yes. Yeah, man. I mean, if you don't know about it, we got a little wish zone. We got our wish zone. Check out our wish zone. It's a bunch Look, of critically zone. needed things like Nicolas Cage posters. <laughs> don't, don't judge me. Don't judge me, man. Um <laughs> And he picked this up. We, we had a little um, Amazon workaround. This is why we have an Amazon list and not like insert store here because Amazon took care of it. Took a little mm-hmm. while. Sent us a note. He says, hi, Vin. I'm going to assume he meant hi, Vin and Pedro. Maybe he just doesn't hate me. Um, hopefully this in Paler because that's what this is the host in Paler. We have Linus down. He's, he's the low man on the totem pole, the important one. And then we got this Yahoo mm-hmm. up here. Won't break your glass table. Smiley face regards Arthur and I, I don't think you're being sincere, sincere about the. <laughs> I hope it doesn't break it. Wink. I'm kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, man. Thanks. Uh, again, all that, all, all that stuff. You guys have just enabled like uh, Game Shark cheat mode. We are way ahead of schedule. Sticking our mm-hmm. little two bit studio together to hopefully bring you marginally better than completely bad content. So thank you. And if you've been thinking about uh, kicking us a shackle, you know, do it. You get some cool stuff in return. Like especially hanging out with the, um, all of our cray crays in our discord, the other oh, six yes. days a week. We love them. <laughs> I say that as a fellow cray. There's a lot of people in there and they're always on about something. I, th- I think it was, um, Steve-O. I was like, this is the weirdest, weirdest place. And it's like, if, yeah, if you go back and read how the conversation jumps around, it's a little terrifying. All right. Uh, let's have a slice of pie, man. Let's get Ooh, into yeah. it. So we have a very um, sonorous, sonorous. We, we got some Oons and Wom, man. This thing looks yeah. expensive because we're talking about the open NSYNC, the super experimental physical interface for instant I was like, hmm. a machine learning algorithm developed at Google's brain magenta is it magenta yeah team to generate new unique sounds man you can make all these crazy sounds without drugs that doesn't seem fun um, <laughs> but it does require a raspberry pi and it, it actually does look really pretty and it looks like something I might want to play oh it's got an OLED display neat um mm-hmm. Who who would who would use this? Somebody sent us some feedback on what you. I mean, outside, would you just do it for music? I would do it just to like poke at it and like make noise. Device, <laughs> the device that makes noise. If you have a lot of people coming around your house and you want to scare them away quickly, uh, yeah, just put like the the little uh, touch sensitive uh, area. Expose it somewhere. Somewhere where it sticks out and people go there and they touch it and it makes really funky sounds. I I, I mean, that's either going to scare them away or keep them coming back. So, Well, I'm assuming it's that 50/50. the touchpad allows you to do very... I'm going to end up yes. building one of these for no reason whatsoever because... <laughs> yeah, no, you can... Uh, it's the, the different coordinates do the different sounds and I, you can adjust with the little nubs at the end and you can make make it look pretty with different It's like pieces. an etch a sketch for noise, man. <laughs> I want one. Put put it all over me. It's a uh... <laughs> That's cool. And hey man, listen, I understand yep. somebody out there is like, but it came from Google and I'll never use that. That's that's fine, man. That's fine. But okay, it's open source. It's okay. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> all right. Uh up next, Iron Man. I uh, nope. That's not. You can't blame me for that pun because it's right here at three fourteen. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is the Pirate Man, and he's got some. Uh, I cannot unsee his nipples through his shirt. Well, uh, that's what we were here for. We we're here to talk about that wait, mask. Wait, what wait, he wait, seems wait, to be wait, wearing, wait. and you may notice that there's something like glued to the side of his head there. Nope, I, I can't and, see past yeah. the nipples. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took me a while too. But <laughs> it's uh, that thing that's sticking out the side there are a bunch of uh, GPIO pins attached to a little PCB that runs into a Raspberry Pi and a couple of um, really fancy displays that are being reflected off of two very thin uh, sheets of plastic at a certain angle, so they look just right, and they give you a little heads-up display. Yes, someone is actively building the Iron Man mask with all the fancy stuff. Of course, it doesn't do eye-tracking yet, nor does it... Uh, it can't really see what you're looking at and impose things on that. Do the whole... The, the end goal I, for I this just one, like, which I'm just guessing like the is fact AR. That you could take out Iron Man by like doing that with a cup of water. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, the thing uh, it's on that very picture that you're looking at. If you look at the top right, the GPIO pins are coming right into your face, right there. <laughs> okay, so so you can just uh, boop Iron Man <laughs> on the left side of his face and take him down. Got it. Yeah, you just slap him. It's like. Uh, <laughs> but it does do um, kind of a little uh, AR type projection, though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's very rudimentary. Again, it doesn't do eye tracking, doesn't do any of that. But that's the future goal. That's uh, I'm guessing what he will be trying to go for at a later date. And yes, please do do. Uh, I I may be tempted to try and do it myself if someone succeeds. Yeah. It Hey man, I wouldn't say too much because this dude looks like he'd kick our butt. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's got some sweet nipples. <laughs> he could probably kick your butt with his nipples. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, that's going to do it for the show. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, head over to LinuxGameCast.com, tap that contact button. Um, we do a couple of shows. We do LGC Weekly. That's a show that pays the bills. So we're able to do this show and our streams on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And we're going to be adding a Friday stream very very shortly if you want to leave feedback for saturdays that's great wednesdays lwdw tap on that give us a name give us an email a subject and your message and you got to prove you're smarter than the bot shouldn't be too difficult you can leave us comments mm -hmm. on twitter um and facebook but there's no 100 percent guarantee i did have this conversation uh it's like but i don't want it tracked on your web the, the website's internal i mean that's all of our stuff so if you, if you want something that's like not out on whatever, you know, it's like, I'm doing it because it's more secure or whatever to leave it on YouTube. Okay. Whatever. Let's you sleep better at night, Brad. <laughs> yes. YouTube, the big platform, the platform that everyone, you know what? Let us know. Let us know how you disagree. Let us know your grievances. Let us know. Um, I don't know. Let us know if it's raining. How about, <laughs> how, about, how about you let us know whether or not you get a problem with Pedro's face? Well, I'm surprised it took anyone this long, but this comes from Orn. What do you mean and this Orn long? Says, I'm surprised it took Orn this long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, well, I don't hate Pedro's face. I just want to shove a cactus down Pedro's throat for absolutely no reason. Uh, you know, Orn, coming from you, I expected that cactus to go... Somewhere else. You know, uh, here, here's the thing. Coming from Orn A, you're not bringing your A game. B, you're like a week late on that because we talked about that last week with somebody finding uh, Pedro incredibly sexy and attractive. And so much so that we should leave a disclaimer at the beginning of each show that you were going to be melted by his brilliance and radiance. Um C, or you need to hurry up and get stateside because you know what? We got to pay extra for the cactus thing. And if you're willing to do that mm -hmm. for free, bonus soda for us. Now, on a more serious note, this is a question that I was even kind of like, yeah, that's actually a good question from Camper Marvin. Okay. RM, is there a good way to recover accident? Wait, okay. That nope. Good English. I, I was going to grammar Nazi mm -hmm. too early. Is there a good way to recover accidentally deleted files on Linux? Question mark. EXT undelete EXT and undelete. test disk do not look to be designed for human use. You know that uh, I'll kind of give you that last one. <laughs> hmm. uh, you know, test disk is actually all right. Uh, 
compared to a exe and elite anyways but uh that that that's not a very high bar for comparison uh i've used test disk it's whenever someone asks me uh i oopsed a file can you help me get it back give me and just test disk go through the things it's very well explained if your terminal is big enough you can see the little explanation of what each of the options does and it does a very good job at that i feel so yeah no my suggestion would be try to learn test disk because it's really good i've restored uh partition tables on entire ssds without losing anything so that's pretty good so step one is immediately unmelt the volume yeah you might want to throw that in there somebody's asking that type of question might not understand that. <laughs> Test disk does that for you. It, once you pick which drive you want to start working on, it will unmount it okay, and only mount step one. Step one, boot from a live media like a USB drive. Oh, yeah, no, you don't want to do it your internal. Step two, <laughs> you don't never want to accidentally... rely on Pedro for two things, instructions or directions, because he's going to forget <laughs> gangs of parts and you're going to be left like alone. <laughs> With a cactus, wondering <laughs> Look, what went wrong. Some things I just assume that people know the good etiquette to, uh, you know, recover a um, don't recover a hard drive on a production I'm, box. Listen, man, unless I, you're really sure of what you're doing. <laughs> I'm bad enough to where it's really hard to communicate some things because you know, two decades with Linux. But even I could say, all right, if you're asking about that, normally I'm going to say with me. Almost 100%. It, it, it's gone, man. I, I just let it go. <laughs> if I didn't think enough of it to have it r synced or just throw it around somewhere else, it wasn't important to me in the first place. Unless I just need something to do for a day. Data recovery is something I tend to avoid. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right. Like, But let us know how you um, choose to or to not recover. Maybe you have a... Uh, Maybe there's a really good tool, like a one-button tool. Yeah. See, I think... Like a GUI. Something with a GUI. A GUI that doesn't require you to unmount the file system. <laughs> it's hard mode. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, 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 what? All right, hang on. we, we got to roll the credits, but we'll continue talking about this. Boom. Yeah. Why don't we see if we can get some of them up and running in wine? Oh, now you're just playing with fire. <laughs> but you know, if uh, if the tool that works on Windows had its roots in Unix-like operating systems and the commands that it runs are actually Unix commands, then Wine would see that and it would go, Oh, I know those. I have a kernel here that speaks that. There you go. So, it could be okay. Because I, you can make Windows read EXT. Yeah.